Welcome back to the last video in this 2017 winter series. I'm Raj Kletke. I do have to apologize for a few blurry pictures that snuck in this year without my notice. But first, I want to thank all of you for watching these videos. I know that the lecture format is not for everyone, but I hope that you did get some enjoyment out of them. So let's take a quick look at the flies we tied and how and when I used them. The zebra midge, most commonly in a size 20, I use for searching and midge hatches, fishing it below the surface, anywhere from near the bottom to near the top of the water column, depending on what level I believe the fish are feeding. Sometimes fish will take midges at all levels. The tumble fly, most commonly in a size 20 to 24, I fish in the surface or just subsurface during active midge hatches when I'm seeing rising fish. The simple wrap, I fish mainly on the surface during small mayfly emergences, especially blue-winged olives. I vary the size to match the mayfly. Occasionally I'll use this for a midge emergence also. The WD-40, I fish just subsurface during active blue-winged olive emergences with obvious rising fish. I'd match the blue-winged olive size, usually with a size 18 to 20. The minke in size 14, I fish for searching as a deep nymph, especially on waters with sow bugs and scuds, but occasionally just as a general searching pattern. The mini neon in size 10, 3x long, I fish with my four weight rod when I want to use a streamer. Larger streamers might be more effective at times, but not as much fun to cast on my light fly rod. The flashback pheasant tail nymph I fish whenever an imitative mayfly nymph is called for. Sometimes I'll use it as a general searching pattern as swimmer and crawler mayfly nymphs do end up in the drift frequently, but I especially like it for the pre-emergence hatch of blue-winged olives or other mayflies. We also tied a very simple variant of the pheasant tail nymph that works quite well for size 20 and smaller, otherwise uh, using it the same as I did the classical pheasant tail nymph. Occasionally I'll use this for midges also. The emergent sparkle pupa, most commonly in sizes 14 and 16, I fish for caddis pre-emergent and emergent hatches. I probably should have included a trico spinner as I really enjoy fishing that spinner fall also, but that is already covered in my series on fly fishing hatches. So, these are the flies that I fish with most of the time and catch most of my trout on. They aren't the only flies that I carry in my fly box, but they are my go-to flies in the very common situations that I described with each pattern. But, should you be using these flies also? Well, that depends on many factors, including two major ones. First, are you fishing similar situations? And do you already have flies you have confidence in for these situations? You will catch more trout with a fly pattern you have confidence in. You will use it more often, you will fish it longer before getting discouraged and changing flies, and you'll fish it better having gained some experience in how to use it. Hence, you will catch more trout on it. The exact fly pattern may not be as important as we like to think. Presentation is likely more important than the specific fly, although a reasonable fly, not necessarily the absolute best fly for the situation you're fishing, is important also. So if you already have a fly you have confidence in, you may do better by learning to fish it even better rather than changing flies. If you're an advanced fly fisherman or woman, you probably already have your favorite flies, and they may well be better than my choices. It's unlikely that the flies I listed will catch more trout for you, but they may be easier to tie, so if you feel like it, tie up a few and try them also. But if you're a beginner or an intermediate fly fisherman like I am and don't already have favorite flies, try these. For the most part, they're simple to tie, so tie up a few, at least three of any given pattern, so you, if you lose some, you still have some to fish with. Watch for situations where they should be fished, and then fish them as best you can with as much confidence as you can muster. Once you've caught a few trout with a pattern, tie up additional sizes and colors if wanted. Don't, however, shortchange the fly by fishing it in the wrong setting. For example, while both are great flies, the sparkle pupa doesn't fish well during a blue-winged olive emergence, and the... WD-40 doesn't fish well during a caddis emergence. Again, learn to recognize the proper setting for each fly. 
Getting confidence in fishing midges is difficult for many beginner and intermediate fly fishermen, but is very important. Fishing midges will greatly increase your opportunity for fishing hatches and number of fish caught. So resolve this year to tie at least some size 20 zebra midges and add one as a dropper to your searching nymph or searching dry fly. Give the zebra midge a fair trial and you will gain confidence in it quickly. Once you realize how good midge fishing can be, you'll want to tie adult forms also, the tumblefly, Griffith's gnat, etc. You might get to like midge fishing as much as I do. If you've been watching my videos that may not be that entertaining, but I hope are informative, you are likely quite serious about your fly tying and fly fishing. There are so many aspects of fly tying and fly fishing, so, so choose what interests you. But here are some suggestions that have enriched my fishing. During the off season, increase your skills. Practice casting in your backyard or at a park. Learn some new casts that will help you better fish some of the difficult situations you ran into in previous seasons. Learn some new techniques. Learn some entomology. Or maybe just read some history about fly fishing. You can do this through watching videos or reading books. While my videos are on simple entomology and hatches are a very amateurish try to explain these issues by an intermediate fisherman, they should help you get started. If you don't already, learn to tie flies. There is nothing that I can think of that will enrich your trout fishing experience more. Try to learn what your tying represents. In other words, a little entomology also. When planning a fishing trip on distant waters or even your local waters, educate yourself by reviewing hatch charts for the season and the water you'll be fishing. You can usually find them online for major areas, even your local waters. Talk to fly shops or other fishermen. Buy a few recommended flies from the shop to use as a prototype. Tie appropriate flies for what you anticipate you'll need. Tying flies for and anticipating the trip are sometimes much of the fun of a trip. One streamside, be observant as you walk to the water. Are there grasshoppers, ants, beetles in the meadows or woods you're walking through? Have the spider webs trapped insects of interest? If you shake the streamside brush, do caddis fly out? Look at the water for a while. Are there rising fish, maybe just scattered rising fish? Or maybe there's no apparent activity. What water type will you be fishing? What techniques should you use? Try to make logical choices to start and then reassess those initial choices if they're not productive. If you go with a guide, do all the preliminary things we talked about also, but use the guide as a great learning opportunity and follow his or her advice, but don't be passive. Ask what hatches you may be seeing during the day. Look closely at the fly the guide is recommending and ask about it. What does it represent? Why did he or she choose it for this season and this time of day? How is it tied? What technique is being recommended and why? If you're having problems with your casting, perhaps the guide can help. When fishing is slow, ask your guide to help you with a technique that you're unfamiliar with or have little confidence in, perhaps wet fly fishing, which is a very good but little used technique. Most guides love to teach. When fishing is slow and you're not with a guide, sit on the side of the stream and try to read the water. Observe how the currents react, how would how you would need to cast to get a dead drifted fly to the likely trout lies. Pick up some rocks and vegetation in the stream and try to identify the organisms present. Read about them later when you get home. Expand your knowledge of entomology. What's under the rocks may not always be that helpful with what is currently in the drift, so you can't always choose a fly based on this, but it will help you with future choices of what flies to tie and fish. I talk a lot about enriching your fishing experience. Catching more and larger trout enriches my fishing experience and is a worthwhile goal. It is, if you will, a report card about how well your skills and knowledge of trout fishing are coming along. Concentrate on your skills and knowledge in catching more and larger trout and in more varied situations will follow. 
and likely you'll soon find that improving your skills and knowledge have become your major goals with catching more trout becoming secondary. Then that once boring fishless hours become hours for observation, planning, working on skills, and anticipation of what to do when the fish become active again, as they will. Well, we've come to the end of this year's series. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed putting it together. I'm Raj Kletke. Enjoy the upcoming season, and hopefully I'll see you next winter. P.S. If you have any suggestions of general topics that you and others might be interested in for next winter's series, please let me know in the comments. Thanks.